The Gran Turismo series pitches itself as the real driving simulator. In a world where sims like Assetto Corsa Competizione, Richard Burns Rally and R Factor 2 exist, the title Real Driving Simulator is a bold claim, and one that doesn't fully stand up to scrutiny. However, Gran Turismo 7 is perhaps the most realistic feeling and difficult GT game in the series yet, providing a challenge to experienced sim racers and casual fans alike. Part of the realistic experience of a sim is setup tuning, and in GT7 this equates to buying upgraded parts from the tuning shop and fitting them to your car. This opens up a wealth of opportunities for GT7 players to tweak their car setup, potentially making them quicker. But different options can be changed on different cars, and one change on a front-engined front-wheel drive car may not work on a mid-engined rear-wheel drive car. To help with this, we turn to our resident setup guru, Ross McRollbar. We could have called him Lightning McGregor, but Ross McRollbar felt more appropriate. He has devised a handy setup guide offering pointers on which upgrades to buy and the setup options they unlock. We'll also cover which settings to change to make your car the fastest it can be, and in this video we will be focusing on FF cars, which stands for Front Engine, Front Wheel Drive in the world of GT7. Cars like this tend towards understeer, given that the front tyres must both steer and drive the car at the same time. Most of the mass of the car is on the front axle too, meaning the rear tyres have a much easier time, causing less wear. If you want to know the differences between all of the different drivetrain and engine layouts, be sure to keep an eye on the channel for a future video on this very subject. So then, with all of that in mind, it was time for Ross to pick an FF machine, and there are none more iconic than the 1998 Honda Civic Type R, known for its punchy and shouty 1.6 litre VTEC engine. Ironically, we are going to need to purchase parts from the understeer engineering tuning shop, in order to engineer out the understeer. Here are all the tuning parts you will need to unlock every setup option. Firstly, you're going to need soft sports tyres from the sports section, then ballast from the club sports section the fully customizable computer and limited slip diff or LSD from the semi racing section, and then finally from the racing section, brake balance controller as well as fully customizable suspension and racing transmission. The Type R's PB sits at 484.34 after all of these purchases. For this setup test, Ross chose Brands Hatch Indy. Why? Well, we have fast corners, medium speed corners, high speed chicanes, elevation changes, hairpins and a couple of tricky trail braking zones. In other words, it's a huge test of the car's handling, and hopefully will highlight the effects of tweaking setups. If you're making your own setup, it's always a good idea to familiarise yourself with the car and track before making any adjustments. Ross managed a best lap of 53.824 seconds, with a theoretical optimum lap of 53.791. Time to start meddling. His first change was to adjust the brake balance, moving it plus 3 to the rear. This immediately improved the feel of the brakes and helped reduce understeer into Paddock Hill Bend and through McLaren and Clearways. This only made him a tenth of a second faster, but more importantly, the car behaved in a far better way under braking, improving turn-in and allowing him to drag the brakes into the apex more. The key difference here was consistency. Next up, it was time to look at the suspension, and the first major change Ross made was lowering the ride height to the minimum value. This lowers the centre of gravity of the car, making it more agile through the corners, and also giving it a slight aerodynamic benefit by reducing the surface area of the car as it cuts through the air. This increased the PP value by less than one point, but immediately the car can now take certies with barely a lift in fourth gear. Seven tenths are knocked off the lap time, with the optimum now breaking into the 52s. That's more like it. It's also worth adding that minimum ride height won't always be the best. Sometimes a raised rear end will help turn in and agility, but not in this case. You may also need to raise it slightly to avoid aquaplaning in wet weather, or to prevent bottoming out on kerbs, but try to keep it as low as you can get away with. Thanks to the fully customizable racing transmission we purchased from the tuning shop, we can tailor the car's gear ratio to suit every single track. For Brands Hatch Indy, we need a shorter gear ratio given how small the straights are. It's all about staying in the car's peak rev range as often as possible, so compromise is key. Ross realised that the Civic only needed to reach a top speed of 190 km per hour at this circuit, and thankfully GT7 has a feature where you can set a maximum required speed and the game will automatically determine the ratios for you. You can of course tune the ratios yourself, and this will help if you need to change things for a certain corner. In this example though, Ross never needed to do this. With the shorter gears, Paddock Hill Bend is now 4th gear instead of 3rd, and the final corner is now 3rd instead of 2nd, which helps with traction on corner exit. Gearing the little Honda correctly for Brands increases its PP to 494.40, and he has now gained a second in lap time after changing three simple setup options. Camber is the inward or outward tilt of the tyre looking from the front. The idea of altering this is to ensure that as much of the tyre's contact patch is touching the road as possible under cornering loads to achieve optimum grip. 
Without going into too much detail about suspension setup, some negative camber will positively affect grip while cornering, at the slight expense of stability under braking and uneven tyre wear. Although the Civic allows for up to negative 6 degrees of negative camber on the front axle, using negative 5 degrees seem to offer the best compromise in terms of cornering and braking. When it comes to the rears, well, that can be cranked to the maximum negative value as we don't need to worry about rear tyres being overworked with this type of car. With these changes, Ross found he could carry more speed in the corners at the cost of some turn and hesitation, especially under braking for paddock hill and clearways. The PP increased by one point with these changes and two tenths were shaved off of the lap time. Anti-roll bars, or ARBs, essentially do as they say. They control the body roll of a car independent of suspension and damper settings. In GT7, smaller ARB numbers equate to a softer ARB setting, and larger numbers equal a stiffer setting. In simple terms, softer settings at the front and stiffer settings at the rear will encourage oversteer, and vice versa. In this case, Ross set the front anti-roll bar to a firm 6, with the maximum being 10, and the rear to a minimally soft 1, increasing the car's PP by 1 point. This made the car feel less lively in the corners, but therefore more stable and predictable, which helped with consistency. To experiment further, he made the front anti-roll bar as soft as possible and the rear as stiff as possible, a known sim racer tactic designed to provoke the most oversteer from a car. This ended up slowing the car down by a few tenths, something we feel is encouraging. Unrealistically extreme settings don't work in GT7. More on that later. When looking from above the car, the toe angle refers to what extent the tyres point towards and away from the car's body. Pointing the tyres towards the car, called toe in, helps with stability in corners, although adding toe out can enhance turn in. It's a setting you can tune to your preference, but Ross added 0.14 degrees of toe in on the front axle and 0.10 degrees of toe out on the rear. The car's PP increased again to 496.99. Adding toe out to the rear works very well on a front wheel drive car, as it helps the rear steer the front of the car through the turns. Remember, the front tyres have a lot of work to do on a front wheel drive car, so any extra help the rear can provide is a no loss outcome. Testing this out on track made a marked difference to the way the car handled faster turns like the entry to Surtees. The car's front axle felt much more alive, and the rear followed suit mid-turn. There was another tenth off the PB. As we now reach a state of diminishing returns with regards to lap time gains, it's interesting to see how car behaviour is still noticeably different the more you delve into GT7's set of options. So far, every change resulted in a logical result based on McRollbar's understanding of engineering and car behaviour, so quite an encouraging sign in terms of GT7's real driving simulator boast. Natural frequency is another way to describe the relative stiffness of the car's handling in GT7. Higher values essentially mean stiffer springs, and lower values equate to softer springs. Springs absorb bumps in the road, support the car's weight, and generally help keep the tyre in touch with the road, working in conjunction with dampers. Measured in hertz, the aim is to reach a nice handling balance between front and rear values, and the default values for natural frequency in GT7 seem to work quite well. As an experiment, Ross turned the front axle setting up to 3.20 hertz and set the rear to a relatively soft 1.46 hertz. The PP rose above 508, but the car was horrible to drive. Essentially, what happened here was that the stiffer springs on the front axle created much better turn-in, but as the rear springs were still quite soft, the balance of the car was all wrong, and the oversteer was too much. His compromise was matching the front and rear frequency rates to 2.05 Hz. The car felt more balanced now, but still with a little oversteer mid-corner to hook the front end towards the apex. It was livelier to drive, so might be a handful on a longer stint, but he gained just under a tenth of a second in lap time. The PP may have reduced to 500, but this felt so much better, and was faster. Adjusting the fully customizable LSD, or Limited Slip Differential, changes the car's behaviour on acceleration and braking. Raising the acceleration sensitivity setting can induce instability and oversteer, and lowering it can do the opposite. Similarly, raising the braking sensitivity values will increase the chances of understeer when decelerating or coasting, making the car more stable, but decreasing the setting can help with turning the car into corners. The initial torque setting is an overall adjustment of how fiercely the LSD effect kicks in. So higher values mean the car changes its behaviour more gradually, and low settings mean a quicker rate of change. Fine-tuning the LSD settings to find the best way forward takes a lot of time, but Ross found the acceleration default setting of 40 to be a good compromise for the Civic. Adjusting this setting further resulted in slower lap times, and just to check the validity of the LSD modelling in-game, he tried it out at maximum and minimum levels. Thankfully, at minimum values the car suffered from catastrophic wheel spin exiting Druid's hairpin, and maximum values created too much oversteer. As you'd expect then. Good job, Gran Turismo.
Altering the braking sensitivity setting also failed to make much of an impact. Moving it to its minimum value, 5, to enforce more turn-in was too extreme, causing uncontrollable oversteer at times on corner entry. To compensate, Ross then increased the initial torque value up to 20 to help take the edge off the oversteer, and this worked to a degree, but ultimately wasn't quicker than the default LSD settings. More predictable, yes. Faster, no. This next one is always important when it comes to setting up cars. In fact, we probably should have mentioned it a bit earlier. A damper's role in a car is to help control the spring and therefore the weight transfer of the car. Dampers really kick in on corner entry and exit, or bumpy surfaces, curb strikes for example. The key is to keep as much of the tyre in touch with the road as possible, so dampers that are too soft may lead to the car bouncing, not ideal for keeping the tyre on the road. Too stiff, and the tyre can be pulled off the track surface after hitting a bump. Compression and expansion are more commonly known as bump and rebound. Bump absorbs compression forces, while rebound is the rate at which the damper returns to its original state. The key is finding a happy medium that works for the car and track, which can take time. Ross reduced the Honda's damping, ratio, compression and expansion settings to 20% and 35% respectively, both on front and rear, making the car a little softer overall. This didn't provide ultimate lap time, but its optimum lap reduced to 52.251, a whole one hundredth of a second off. The key thing is though, he was able to lap consistently in the 52.4s and 52.5s, as the car had extra grip and a more progressive feel between understeer and oversteer. So, after all of that, Ross decided to stick with these settings for his Yappy Type R Terrier. Feel free to copy them and see what you think. GT7 covers a range of setup options and all seem to affect the car in a believable way. What is most pleasing though is that extreme setup options don't seem to work which we unfortunately have seen recently in Assetto Corsa Competizione and R Factor 2, with their toe and anti-roll bar setup quirks. From the stock setup, Ross was able to reduce his lap time by 1.5 seconds on a short 1.2 mile track. The biggest single effect came from lowering the ride height, gaining nearly 8 tenths, followed by 2 tenth gains from adjusting gear ratios and increasing negative camber. After that, changes freed up less and less lap time, with the dampers, ballast and limited slip differential making little to no difference. Of course, the changes made on this little front-wheel drive Honda won't necessarily work on a mid-engine supercar, but a lot of the theory does cross over. The key thing to remember is setups take a lot of work, and are often a case of balancing two conflicting settings to achieve the best compromise. It takes a lot of tinkering to get the optimum setup, and there's rarely a single magic bullet option. In a way, it's gratifying to see Gran Turismo 7's setup options in action, but it still lacks some basic settings such as tyre pressures, which hints that GT's tyre model isn't on par with the likes of ACC or R Factor 2. For a casual racing game fan though, and even for sim enthusiasts like us, there are plenty of setup options to get stuck into. It's also a bonus that GT7's driving model is more rewarding than perhaps any console racing game we've ever seen before. Have you used our setup guide to improve your Gran Turismo 7 Pro S? How did it work for you? Have you found your own setup magic to conquer the menu books? Let us know in the comments below. Subscribe to the Traction channel for lots of useful GT7 content in the future, and hit the notification bell to catch our videos as they are released. Until next time, from myself and Mr McRollbar, thank you so much for watching, keep it pinned, and have a great day.